أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين بالقاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو اصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الم نجعل الارض مهادا والجبال اوتادا وخلقناكم ازواجا وجعلناكم وجعلنا نومكم صباتا وجعلنا الليل لباسا وجعلنا النهار معاشا صلوات بيج محمد وعلي محمد السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ آئی ریسائٹیڈ آیات نمبر سکس ٹو الیون فرام سور نبا چیپٹر نمبر سیونٹی ایٹ آف وچ وی ہیو بین ڈوئنگ دی تفسیر فار دا پاس فیو نائٹس ناؤ اینڈ لاسٹ نائٹ وین وی فنشڈ آف وی ور ڈوئنگ دی ڈسکشن ان ریفرنس ٹو آیت نمبر فائیو آف آیت نمبر سکس آف وٹ وچ ٹاکس اباؤٹ الم نج علی الارد مہادا And just want to refresh the discussion that we had done. Uh, I think there is an issue in the ladies. They can't see it. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the discussion, so just a recap from yesterday so then they won't miss out on anything. That we talked about how this mihad refers to either the cradle and uh, this mihad is a resting place. Um, which obviously a child or you know a toddler finds comfort in it and also the word mihad could be translated as tamheed uh, which is the muqaddama which is the preface to something else for example if someone is writing a book you know there's this muqaddama that is there which is going to go ahead and give you the gist of entire um, you know book so moving on from that discussion it was a very uh, you know uh, extensive discussion that we went into it But you see how that ayat is related with this ayat. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِحَادًا That did we not make the earth a resting place? Right after that he said, وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادًا And the mountains, stakes, you know, they made these mountains into um, that which is firmly grounded. And there is a reason why it is firmly grounded. And I'll translate that. So the word, the mahad needs tying up. You know, mahad, this earth, which is a comfortable place for resting, it needs tying up. It has to be secured, you know, either with ropes or, you know, ropes have to be tied to the ground, similar to how you put on a tent and then you have the sides, you know, put inside the, in the ground. So you, you know, throw in some nails, you hammer them into the ground. And that's the concept, if you can just picture it. So the word awtad, which is the plural for watad, meaning nails you hammer. So if you were to take a nail and you just hammer in the ground or nail, uh, you know, hammer it into the, uh, onto the wall if you're trying to, you know, for example, hang something. So it says, if this earth, this cradle, is a resting place, then it needs something which is well grounded so that, you know, it remains without shaking. It remains firm. You know, you don't always have the fear of falling off of it. So amongst the miracles of Quran is that the roots of mountains are in the depths of the earth, which keeps the pallets from shaking continuously, which obviously prevents, you know, earthquakes from taking place. Earth is layers on top of layers. We've always been mentioned this, you know, how there are layers inside um, this surface that we live upon. And so it makes perfect sense for these mountains to go in and sort of pierce through these layers and keep them from violently shaking. Now, where there aren't mountains, you find that earthquakes are more frequent over there, and uh, this phenomena is there. Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al-Balagha, in the first sermon where he talks about the creation of the earth and the creation of Hazrat Adam, and you know, obviously the entire khutbah is um, talking about the discussion, which is uh, things that are in your surrounding, He said, وَتَّدَى بِالسُّخُورِ بَيَدَانَ أَرْضِهِ And Allah made firm the shaking earth with rocks. 
So here the word rocks is re referring towards these same mountains that are keeping this earth from shaking. So there are other benefits of mountains. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah said, وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادَ And we made these mountains as awtad, firm, grounded. So what are the benefits of it? One of the benefits is that keeps the earth from shaking violently and for preventing earthquakes to take place. Number two, there are other benefits of mountains. It preserves the snow in winter upon it and then eventually lets the water down, for example. Prevents strong winds, you know, from coming down into the valleys or coming down to the ground. Um, place where minerals and precious stones are found. This is in the depths of the mountains. That's where you go ahead and search for these things. And that's where you find these gems as well. As we recite, and we will recite in Dua Joshan Kabir on the night of Qadr, that one of the segments, it says, Yaman fil jibale khazainu. Or the one who has kept the treasures inside what? Inside the jibal, inside the mountains. So we find that there are so many you know, benefits that are associated with geologists. Obviously, they know more and they know better. And maybe in 100 years time, when there's more um, you know, advancement, the tafsir of this ayat will be different. You know, right now, because of the limited knowledge that we have about what we have been able to explore regarding mountains, this is all we can do the tafsir of it. But 100 years from now, when they have discovered even further more regarding these mountains, then you will see definitely the tafsir of this ayat will be different. And then from there, it changes. وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja. That, أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ mihada, The discussion of earth, earth and earth, and then the discussion of mountains. And then it takes a turn. Discussion started with the world and what's in it, and then curved into the residence of this world. So the first ayah about, about the earth, second ayah about the mountains, and then the third ayah now curves into those who are the resident inhabitants of this earth. It says, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja," And create you in pairs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you in pairs. And it's a very vast discussion of the creation of insan in pairs. It tells you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created pairs not just for humans, but for everything that He has created, there are pairs. And that's how He deems and he, that's how He wants to see it. So any two things that resemble one another are called zawj. So zawj refers to anything, any two things which resemble. They may not be equal, they may not be musawi, they may not be you know, similar, but it's still because of this resemblance that they have between the two, it's called zawj. So the word azwaj is used over here. The word Qur'an is from qira'at, from recitation. It's a book which must be recited, just kissing it, passing underneath it, respecting, respecting it. It's not enough. One must read Qur'an, that's why it's called Qur'an. Qur'an comes from qara'a. Qara'a means to, that he recited. Iqra, read. So the word came from Qur'an, is derived from qara to recite. And therefore, this is a book which has to be recited. The notion of reading will eventually lead to what? Once you read something, then you will think about it. Then you'll contemplate. Then you'll ponder. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Afala yatadabbaruna fil Quran. Do they not ponder? How will they ponder if they haven't even read it yet? So you see the resemblance between the two. That recitation, there's a link between reading as well as, you know, uh, contemplating. If the Qur'an is read as Qur'an without the Hamza, Qur'an, not Qur'an. So there's a difference between two, Qur'an and Qur'an. If it's read as Qur'an, it means joint or linked with other. From the root Qarn, Taqarun, having resemblance with two things. So therefore you find this ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I think we recited it today um, in our group recitation, that afala. يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ إِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do they not ponder in the book that if it was from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would find much conflict in it. They will find many contradictions in this book. But the fact that it is from one source, there isn't any contradiction. There aren't any conflicts that you see in Quran. Now people went ahead and they started finding contradictions in Quran. 
They started finding, you know, ayat which may go against one another. And I've spoken about this over here before, so I don't want to go in the depths and details of it, but just highlight and just do ishara toward it. For example, they said the ayat of Quran says, um, you know, in regards to um, finding serenity and tranquility, it says um, when in Surah Fajr, you know, O nafs mutmain. Right? Ya ayyatuhun nafsul mutmainna. It says, Ala bidikrillahi tatmainul kulub. Is it not with the remembrance of Allah, hearts are at rest? Right? With the zikr of Allah, your heart is what? At peace. But then at another place it says, Wa ida dukir Allah, Surah Anfal, Wa ida dukir Allah, vajalat kulubuhum. When Allah's zikr is done, their hearts tremble. I say, well, contradiction. Because having peace and tranquility is not equal to what? Istirar is not equal to trembling. It's not equal to, you know, being troubled. So there's this conflict and there's this contradiction. And then there are many such verses that they have narrated. So I've spoken about this. I'm sure it, you know, rings a bell when I bring this discussion up because the majlis that was done over here as well. And I spoke in depth about these concepts. So there are a few ayat. For example, it says, Ittaqullah Fear Allah the way he should be feared. But that another place it says, Ittaqullah mastata'tum. Fear Allah according to your best. And so, well, fear Allah the way it's supposed to be as opposed to do your best. At one point, someone says, no, you have to get a perfect score. And at one point, someone says, well, do your best. These two are not equal. So which one is it? There's a contradiction between these two ayat of Quran, for example, they'll say. At one place, it says that Jahannam is vast. It's so big that it will call out that Halmim Mazid. Is there more? Halim Talati, Allah will ask, are you filled? It says, Halmin Mazid, is there more? Keep sending. But then another place, it says, Makanan Dayyaka. Jahannam is a very tight place. So, well, one place it says it's vast, another place it says it's very tight. It's very tight. So there's this contradiction that exists. No. If you were to, con if, as the ayah says, If you were to ponder in it, and if you see, that if it was from someone other than Allah, there will be much conflict and contradiction in it. But the fact that it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there isn't any conflict and there isn't any contradiction. The discussion coming back to azwaj. So I'll leave those three examples um, with you so you can keep, keep thinking about it. And you, you know, if you've heard those majalis, you'll remember what I said there. But if you haven't, you think about it. You know, how with the zikr of Allah, you're at peace. How with the zikr of Allah, you're not at peace. You know, heart is trembling. How taqwa, fear Allah the way he's supposed to be feared, or fear Allah according to your best. Or third, how jahannam is a vast place, but then at the same time, it's a very tight place. These three things, inshallah, I'll leave it with you. Going back to azwajan. Azwajan, Allah created everything in pairs. Vegetation, animals, humans. And it mentions in Quran. Vegetation, for example, فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِن نَبَاتٍ شَتَّى We brought forth various kinds of vegetarian vegetations. Various kinds, but in azwaj, in pairs. Animals and humans, جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَمِنَ الْأَنْعَامِ أَزْوَاجًا So not only that we have created azwaj, zawj, pairs in humans, but also an'am as far as the, you know, uh, cattle are concerned. So this principle completes you, and this completion leads to your perfection. Yes. This being paired with your you know, partner, this zawj that you call, the two that come together, that make it to be a perfect union. So therefore, husband and wife are naqis individually. They perfect one another when they are put into this union. Individually, they are naqis, and they are in need. Not only that they are, you know, naqis, in, in, you know, insufficient or in defect, but they are also, you know, um, cannot exist, muhtaj. They are also in need. So there's this ihtiyaj that exists. Allah wa ta'ala in Tafsir al-Mizan, under this verse, he says, both men and women in their capacity are incomplete and are in need, naqis and muhtaj. 
With their union, a complete unit comes into existence. Due to this dependency and necessity, they are attracted towards one another. And with this union is accomplished, it results in tranquility and peace. As ayat says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً So this mawaddat and rahma comes when this union is perfect. Every naqis demands perfection. So everything that is incomplete, insufficient, is always looking to complete itself and get towards that perfection. All of us are, you know, human beings and there's naqs in all of us. And we're always looking to become insan kamil to get to that perfection. So therefore, when it comes to being zawj together, the concept is that azwaj, they complete one another. And this completion leads to perfection. But obviously sometimes when it doesn't work out, then it falls apart. But under this verse, we find a very beautiful hadith from the Holy Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's a, if you need any advice regarding a healthy marital lifestyle, any advice, you may have heard speeches after speeches, but if you need any one advice that will work, and this is this hadith right here, that you look at it from the perspective how Prophet is saying this. He said, مَا بُنِيَا فِي الْإِسْلَامِ بِنَاءٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أَعَزُّ مِنَ التَّزْوِيجِ That there isn't any foundation more beloved in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than marriage. That if there is something which is, you know, foundation which is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ there's nothing beyond than this, you know, marital uh, foundation, that this bond that exists. And then right after, when it says, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja," the very next ayah says, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata." So you see that there's a relationship between the azwaj and the nom. If I can just have the attention toward me, I know some people may be reading Qur'an, um, just, just stay focused for, for a little bit because in tafsir, if you get lost, then you're absolutely lost. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And people will be walking in, so don't bother with that. Just stay focused here. So one is the azwaj. And right after azwaj, what the discussion is? Is that وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata Nom. So there must be a very deep connection between zawj and nom. Between you know, being created in pairs as a husband and wife and sleep. That discussion is right after that. And make your sleep for rest. Now, I'm not going to go into that part of it, but I'll explain as to how this is connected with it. It says, Kama tanamuna tamutun, kama tastaykuduna tabafun. The way you sleep, you will die. And the way you wake up, you will be raised tomorrow in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ مَنَامُكُمْ فِي اللَّيْلِ Amongst the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your sleeping at night. So he considers this to be, the sleeping at night to be amongst his sign. There are two words that are used in this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we made your sleep subat. Subata. What is subat? The word subat is derived from the word sabat. Sabat meaning discontinuation of work and resting to provide comfort to the body and soul. Therefore, Jews refer to as Sabbath, Yomus Sabbath, and which literally means the day of rest. So they don't work that day, and they rest that day. And that's where the word Subat is coming from, that we made your sleep to be a matter of rest. And these statistics I found online, that 50 to 70 million U.S. adults have a sleep disorder. 25 million U.S. adults have obstructive sleep apnea. And according to CDC, one in three adults don't get enough sleep. You just see what are the results, what are the repercussions, what are the effects of this if this thing is not fulfilled. And then, you know, the entire discussion regarding this, I will refrain from going into because if I do, I will not be able to do much justice. I wanted to tonight also focus on another uh, discussion. And... That is, you've been hearing all along and the announcements have been made and that is in regards to the expansion project of Masjid Ali. 
Um, you know, there's obviously within 10 years or less than 10 years, we've realized that we need to expand, and which is only a good thing. You know, this is a good problem to have, that when you realize that you have to expand. That means what? That means people are attending more and more. That means the population is increasing. That means people are showing interest in what this place has to offer. So therefore, with that said, you know, there are a lot of projects that are, you know, uh, lined up. And um, they're, they're obviously something which will be serving us better. You can see the constructions that are happening in the back as well as in the front, which sometimes could be difficult when it comes to parking. And yes, we realize that fact as well. But this is something which, you know, you guys were there from the very beginning when this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was being, was even in the vision and was even put together and difficulties that was there. And alhamdulillah, now you're sitting in this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're able to attend the programs and other things that it has to offer. You know, a complete package where you don't have to go anywhere else. You find your ibadat over here, you find your fun over here, you find your marriages over here, you find your school over here for your children, everything. And even inshallah gym so that you don't have to go out and work, any, work out anywhere. You find the workout over here as well. So your life is centered toward this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a good way. Not that, you know, you're sitting in the masjid 24-7 just doing tasbih. No, nobody wants that. But coming and having a, you know, good share of ibadat as well as the enjoyment that you need as far as your, you know, enough sleep that you need as this ayat was talking about. So all these projects that are lined up, you know, some of the board directors, inshallah, they'll come up and they'll mention as well um, the list of things that we are embarking. Yes, it is audacious to embark on all of those things at the same time, but I would think our community has proven enough in the past 10 years that they can embark on these, um, you know, um, tr plans and they will be able to fulfill them, inshallah, with the need and with the help of the entire community. And this is the month where we are prepared to sacrifice, we're prepared to give, we're prepared to, you know, use every single um, um, thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us in a way that we can get a better and a bigger return as he promises. If you remember the discussion yesterday in the fourth juz of Quran, which I was summarizing, two things were mentioned, sadaqah and interest. The concept was that sadaqah decreases when you spend out of your wealth and interest increases your wealth. But Quran negates this fact, says no. When you give sadaqah, that increases your wealth. When you usurp, when you use usury or interest, it may seem like an interest that it is increasing your value, but it is actually decreasing the value of your wealth. With that